Okay, and let's go and get started with, uh, with agenda bashing. So is there anything on the agenda that people would like to talk about that is not listed? about um, managing the issues because there seem to be a lot of stale issues or some some that, that just stay there for forever so I uh, understand that in the beginning this was where this thing was happening like on, on this call but maybe we need some other form or format to, to do that that, that sounds good. Uh, do you want to go ahead and add it further down on the agenda? And then we can talk to it when we get there? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I know. Cool. And, and I presume we would right. also be able to talk about stale PRs at the same time. We have a few of those hanging around as well, I think. Yeah, the same, yeah. Cool. cool. Okay. And um, let's see, who was it that was uh, speaking? I think that was Nikolai? Yeah, that that's Nikolai, yeah. That's... I apologize if I, if I got your uh, name incorrect. Actually, I see a an example further up. So <laughs> there we go. <clears throat> okay. Is so anything else that we want to add to the agenda? Okay, in that scenario, uh, let's go ahead and uh, get started. So we have a series of events coming up. Uh, we have a, the first event is uh, part of the KubeCon co-located events is the FIDO Mini Summit on December 10th. And there is going to be a network service mesh session uh, with, two, with two talks that are, that are gonna be set up. So if, uh, if you have a ticket to uh, to KubeCon and you would like to attend this, make sure that you add it's you have, you have to add it on to your registration. So make sure that you do so so you can get in. Uh, so we have KubeCon Seattle, and uh, so KubeCon Seattle is from December 10th to 13th. We have two sessions that are going to talk to talk about network service mesh, where Ed and I will present. And we're asking for anyone to write blog posts or do podcasts or talk about network service mesh in any uh, public medium. That uh, uh, like that, that would that would be great. And so we also we also are going to have uh, network service mesh presented in multiple booths. I will work on getting a list of those booths. Uh, at the very minimum, uh, I believe it's, is there going to be a Cisco booth, Ed? Yeah, so we, we've got a uh, flash demo in the Cisco theater associated with our booth. Apparently, at the level of sponsorship we have, we get a booth here, which I think is very cool. Um, and then the, um, yep. All right, so we also have the Cisco theater. And if you are, if you know of any booths or, or demos where it's going to be at, also please add it into the. I've added it to the events list, so uh, please add it. On, please add your company onto that if you're presenting it. Yeah, I also know there was a little bit of talk of stickers. I don't know if any of that came together. Uh, the stickers are on their way. I mean, they're. Oh, the there'll be stickers. That's awesome. Yes, 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 yes. Awesome. <laughs> I I need to share with you again the edited logo because the guys from the graphics team um, needed to do some additional. Uh, I find that extraordinarily stuff. plausible, given that, that I just sort of whacked it together with sticks. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was the entirely duct tape logo. <laughs> Not for me. I mean, for me, it looked fine, but they were like, uh, no. <laughs> so I, I, I love art department people. They're very pragmatic. Yeah. 
Uh, so, uh, regarding the KubeCon, I just want to remind that on the site we still have a couple of TBDs there, like the happy hour and things like that. So, maybe it's too early, but I don't know. No, I, I think that actually is something we're going to need to sort out really quickly. I know one of the things that I was planning on looking at is some of that stuff this, you know, this week, um, because I've been, I've been typing as fast as I can on code and we're starting to get everything landing in place. Um, definitely want to update the website, not just for the web page, but for example, the getting started page updated with all of our new work and that kind of stuff. Um, Great. Uh, are there any other details uh, that we want to add into KubeCon Seattle that I may be forgetting? Okay. There is also an opportunity. We don't have anything s set up just yet. Um, let's see, FOS, FOSDEM has uh, a date. That date is already passed for submissions. Uh, do you know of anyone set up uh, a uh, submission to FOSDEM? I don't know of anyone. Does anyone else in the know of anyone who's submitted something to FOSDEM? Um, I have submitted some kind of related demo talk. Uh, it is, um, at, if you remember the Istio thing that I showed you. So if they accept it, I might try to kind of do a joint Istio versus NSM demo talk or something. Oh, like that, that would be super, super cool. But oh. that would be a bit, uh, I mean, uh, so. Yeah, that, that would be super, super cool. All right. So announcements. Uh, does anyone have any announcements? All right. So in that scenario, let's head into the main agenda. So the first thing on the list is the skydive integration, which I believe is a demo. So uh, how do we want to proceed? Do you want to do screen sharing? I could I could stop sharing if, if uh, Matthew wants to show what he's got. Uh, I can show something. I have something up and running. That's um, awesome. Running code is good. Uh, so I'm not used to use Zoom, so I don't know how to share exactly. Let's see here. Um, okay. Let's try this. You see the. I see a black screen. I see a black screen currently. Are are you using uh, Fedora? No, I'm using uh, Debian with uh, i3. Uh, ah. and, uh, behave. <laughs> um, Just let me try to 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 share differently. Okay. Okay. I yeah, have a black sure screen. Sometimes the whole desktop works when sharing a particular app doesn't. Yeah, I, I had to change mine to to not use. Um, I think it was Wayland, and I and ended up moving it to use the X11 driver instead because all my screen shares were black screens as well. Mm. Yeah, Wayland doesn't work. Yeah. Okay, uh, I can't even stop sharing. <laughs> I don't have. A... Uh, let me see if I can take the share back, and that may stop you. Yes. Share. Uh, no, actually, I can't take the share back. Okay. <laughs> So there should be a little bar at the top of your screen where you can click stop share. Uh, I don't have uh, access to this, uh, try, this screen try anymore. Alt, um, Alt S. Alt S? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't work to Alt S. OK, post share. Let me... As a as a last ditch effort, you could probably switch to a uh, to a terminal okay. and then kill the PID and then rejoin. Okay. Oh, you got it. You're no longer sharing again. Do you want to try sharing? The... So um, let me try to share. Maybe Firefox will be better. Um, okay. Because... Okay. 
So is this a website or is it a... Um... Yes. Oh, I see something. I see something? something because I have a black I screen on my side. But... <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now you, you should be able to see even if, uh, if I don't see it. But... Yeah, I, I, do you have a multiple monitor setup perhaps? I don't know. I, I, I saw something and then it went away and now I've got black with two green bars. You have black a private okay. message coming in from end panel on IRC notification <laughs> that came up. So something is happening. Help. Is there, is, is it? So Nicolas is trying to help me by, uh, on uh, IRC. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about my IRC channel. Cool. Okay. So basically, well, let me explain what what is, what the demo is doing. Um, <laughs> one, one last uh, one last question is: Is there a publicly available IP address that one of us can point at? No, it only works on my uh, on my laptop, so it doesn't work on the public ad IP address. Um, okay. Because, but you can. It's quite easy to to make it uh, work on your side because uh, I have uploaded the the, the probe. Uh, and uh, basically what it does, I don't know if you are able to uh, think about uh, how uh, Skydive is uh, displaying uh, uh, net namespaces and things like this. Are you familiar with, uh, with the Skydive UI? A little bit, uh, A little but not, bit. not usually. Okay. Mm. Um, so let, let me try to, I will, oh, no, I can't, okay. So basically, in, in Skydive, you will have two uh, namespaces. Uh, and what I'm doing is uh, uh, I'm developing a probe, an NSM probe, which is connecting to, uh, uh, to uh, NSMD. And once it uh, receives a cross-connect that uh, involves two namespaces uh, under the control of Skydive, under the monitoring of Skydive, it creates it creates a link between those namespaces. That's really simple, but uh, that's how it works for now. It only works for local, uh, local uh, connection, not for remote ones, but I'd like to make it work for remotes, of course. And uh, basically for now, it only, it only displays, uh, display, uh, uh, it, only, it only creates a connection between uh, two namespaces displayed by uh, Skydive. Does it make sense? Okay. And for Skydive, a namespace is a pod in this case? Yes. Exactly. Okay. Oh, cool. Um, and so the, the, the good news is I think we, we, once the remote cross-connect stuff lands, which hopefully will be today or possibly tomorrow, um, then you could start you know, doing that as well. So mm -hmm. this is very cool. If you could put somewhere in the notes a link to the code you're working with and any instructions for people to try it out, that would be super helpful. Yeah. Cool. And if you could stop sharing so other people can share. <laughs> okay. Cool. Sorry about that. I will try to uh, have a, a better demo for uh, next, uh, next day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, some sort of it's also good people helping you, so yeah. you should be able to get it sorted out. Mm. Cool. Um, so one other thing as well, we also have a network service mesh uh, website. So one of the things that we, we could do is uh, uh, we could do one of a few things. Number one is if it is safe for people to visit a website, we could see about spinning up a cluster somewhere that has the connections on there so people can then browse through the information themselves as, just like a, as a demo. A uh, second option is we could stick a video up there and a third option is we could stick a couple of pictures uh, up, on, up on the website. So. I think, I think for now I will, uh, I will just share some uh, some uh, capture uh, on the on the related issue. Okay. Cool. Be able to share the uh, the way I'm displaying things and discuss based on the, on on those uh, on those pictures. That's awesome. Okay. That sounds good. Okay. So, is there anything else that we want to talk about on the skydive integration, or should we uh, move to the next section?
I think people from Skydive, Skydive developers are, are on the call too. Uh, and I think to have a better displaying, a better rendering of uh, NSM component, we will have to, uh, to have some kind of help from the Skydive team. In order, what I would like to have is the ability to highlight the, the NSM component, endpoints, clients, and uh, cross-connect link, links. I think it should be the, the main goal. Do, do we share this point of view? That sounds good to me. Okay. Okay, and this needs some kind of hack on the JavaScript managed by Skydive. So I hopefully uh, the Skydive team will uh, help me on that side. I know we have yeah. some folks on the call. Does that sound reasonable to you guys? So definitely, Mathieu, I'm going to help you on this. If you are Great. able to me. So just ping me tomorrow and we'll work on that. Great, thank you. Great. So uh, for an action item then, um, so I'll put Skydive to, I guess to discuss uh, features you want to, you want to highlight. Um, Okay, so uh, next item, item we have on the agenda is match selection for network services. So, uh, Nikolai, uh, you have the uh, you have the floor. Um, yeah, I can share just not much of a demo, but I can just share something. Yep, I stopped can... sharing, so you should be able to share. Yeah, yeah, I will. I guess you see it. So, uh, what essentially I'm showing here is the YAML file of the API extensions that we are trying to do. So uh, we're working closely with it. And uh, this is what we came up with. Uh, actually, there was a discussion with Matthew also. And uh, um, this is already merged. Uh, it's in the master. And now I'm working <coughs> on the implementation of the selector. But uh, this, uh, for now, is uh, um, strongly dependent on uh, five uh, two two, <laughs> the mythic. Uh, um, so many PR. people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, I hope that uh, to tomorrow this will be already in place. I started looking at the code, um, uh, and it looks uh, great. So, uh, what is the the idea here? So we define. Uh, two levels of matching. We have a source selector and a destination selector. Um, the idea is that when the uh, application, uh, actually the client requests a new connection, uh, it will have its uh, uh, labels uh, matched against the source selector and the destination selector, uh, The actually the NAC uh, will have its uh, um, declared labels matched against the destinations selector. So uh, this is a very powerful uh, concept. And if I can scroll a little bit up, this will essentially allow us to do things like this. So this is kind of service chaining, if you wish uh, to call it like that. Um, I guess that it sounds a little bit blurry uh, still, but um, that's more or less what we have today. I guess that once we, we get further, we will we'll be able to, to show a bit more, like a more meaningful demo. Uh, Ed, do you think that this kind of describes what the status today or? Uh, yeah, I think this is great. Do you want to talk about some of the other sort of further out things you've been mulling about? With like uh, the create stuff? Uh, I'm sorry, like what? Ah, the create stuff. Yeah, okay. So we also came up with the idea. I don't know what was the number. Was it the next? Uh... Yeah, there, there should be. I think it's probably the next one. There should be some links in the conversation because I referenced this there. But yeah, I think it's 532 and 533. Uh -huh. Where we talk about rewriting create. Yeah, there was this yeah. uh, creating. Yeah. So uh, there was also this idea of uh, create action. So once uh, the mm, new uh, the new connection uh, establishment is matched, 
like uh, against the source selector, then you can enable a, a route action, which will essentially link it to an uh, NSC that provides the um, asked service. Uh, and uh, you, you, we also uh, played a little bit with the idea of uh, what it would be if we can spawn the service on demand. So that's what create would do for us here. So uh, in the description of the network service, we can uh, just uh, tell the intention of that if someone requests a service, this will be automatically spawned and depending on the configuration, it could be spawned within the same cluster on the same node uh, or different options here. This, uh, this is very, very powerful concept in terms of and also also probably dangerous as with everything that is powerful <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah um, I think that if it's uh, used properly and configured properly this will this will al allow you to to have a very very much dy dynamic configuration of the needed services essentially you you just declare that there will be services but they won't be spawned until they are they are needed which is which is really, really interesting, I think. Cool. Okay, so uh, with that, I think uh, I will stop sharing here and give yeah, the floor to the next guy. Sorry? Just a question, uh, oh. a question about the first uh, pull request you showed. Uh, do we, do we, are we already able to, or do we think uh, we are able to manage an update on, on uh, on such a, on such a network policy. I mean, if we remove one of the component of the of the destination, uh, do how do you manage uh, rewirings, things like this? Uh, no, the it's uh, okay. actually it's it's just the the API that is implemented. So it uh, that's that's what is merged. So it's not okay. uh, it's well, not you, really. You actually bring up a really interesting question, though, Matthew, which is at what point do we rewire? Hmm. with policy changes? Because I can think of at least two answers to this question. The first answer is um, you, you process the selection and the wiring at the time the connection is requested for the client and it stays the way it was, right? So you don't update it when the policy is updated. And okay. there are definitely gonna be circumstances where that's gonna have to be true because some network service endpoint in the chain um, has some kind of state related to that connection that, that hmm. it would be painful to recreate. Um, and then the second one would be to say, and this is definitely something we could do, um, is the question is how to toggle the flag, um, that if the policy is updated, <clears throat> you update the wiring for the connections. Because the beautiful part about the cross connects is I can leave the same kernel interface in your pod um, or the same MIF interface in your pod. Um, <clears throat> and I can change the, the destination connection in that cross connect in the data plane and simply cross connect you to something new. So this allows this should allow us to do things like auto healing. So if a network service endpoint identifiably dies, uh, we could connect you to a new one. Uh, and it should also allow us to do, if we so choose, automatic re automatic rewiring on policy change. Mm. Uh, it's just a question of you know under what circumstances is that a, a good idea? Okay. But super fun. Yeah. But so at first, the first option will be implemented, I think. It's the simplest way. Uh, to yeah, of course. Yes, mm -hmm. we'll start with the simplest thing and then we'll be built on top of that. <coughs> cool. So I'm, I'm hoping that 522 lands today and then it sounds like you're close on its heels there with actually getting the, the basic selection stuff working. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, so are there any uh, questions that anyone has before we uh, move on to the next session? Okay, so we also have uh, some changes with the VPP agent, uh, NSC and NS, NSC, uh, Charlie, and NSE, uh, Echo, and uh, direct uh, MIF connections. So, Ilya, uh, you have the floor. Uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, yes, uh, looks like yesterday I finished my uh, work with VVP agent NSC and NS endpoint. Um, 
as far as I know, it's already a part of uh, integration tests. And uh, it's a little bit changed uh, concept uh, at create pull request or commit. Uh, now we have one site that request connection, it's always uh, something like slave. And the other site is always uh, kind of master, but uh, they don't know that they slave or master, they just have um, destination or source. So it's some changings. And I fix a direct MemIF connection uh, to be the same with that logic. And they create also pull request with some unit tests for converters. And I think that's all about MemIF. Yeah. One other thing I will mention, which is there's now a new make rule called um, make pay eights check. Um, it's super, super helpful because what it basically does is it will go through, uh, right now when we deploy um, with K8's deploy um, or when we're running in the CI, it will deploy um, currently one each, because uh, we're on a single node of the ICMP responder and the VPP agent ICMP responder. Um, and, and then it will deploy two network service clients. And those network service clients will round robin so you're guaranteed that one of them will connect to one type and one of them will connect to the other because both of those are providing the same network service, just implemented differently in terms of MemIF or kernel interface. Um, and so the makes case check will go through and check and make sure that you get the right ping behavior from the clients to somebody providing the service. Um, so it makes it super, super easy to check and see if you've broken things. And um, yeah, we need to verify the um, that uh, all the labels are are set up properly and so on because uh, the CI is now running uh, two nodes, which means it's possible that your NSC and NSE can end up on two different systems. And so um, right now, I haven't seen any breaks uh, related related to it. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, we, we want to make sure that we're testing what we think we're testing. Yeah. yeah. And, and in some of the remote work, I think we're playing with pod affinity and anti affinity for some of this. So if it does become a problem um, before 522 lands, we can do that. And once 522 lands, um, then we should have multi node testing. And the, the pod affinity will put all the network service clients on the same node. Um, and then the pod anti affinity will put one each of the different flavors of NSCs that we have on, on the two nodes that we have. All right. So uh, we have, that actually segues, segues us well into, 520, uh, into uh, 522. So um, Andre, can you uh, tell us about 522? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we almost uh, have uh, NSM to NSM uh, remote connectivity we have it in branch uh, it works locally on the ads and on my environment uh, and we just need to figure out uh, what's happening on continuous integration so in general we have uh, it already almost landed so uh, if NSM uh, have a request from the client and the endpoint is uh, not local one, but found uh, using Kubernetes registry. It uh, has direct connection to remote NSM and do cross connect on both sides with a uh, uh, VX uh, LAN protocol at the moment uh, with remote mechanism. So f after uh, 522 will be landed, it will be possible to cross connect between uh, different nodes with a VX LAN uh, mechanism. Super cool, super, super cool. Um, so by the way, uh, Nikolai, this also means that your VXLAN code worked. <laughs> um, yeah, I idealized that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there was still a minor issue that we were running into with 522 and getting it to, so it works 
on a uh, local vagrant setup, uh, we're having a little bit of, of trouble with it in the circle uh, CI or packet environment. So uh, uh, Ed and I are working to to finish off that those last details, and uh, that way we can get this merged in as uh, as soon as possible. So yeah, and 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 I think we learned a ton in the process. It's it's been really interesting. The, a lot of the process of writing network service uh, mesh code has been you get something working, and then you look at what you've written, and you say, okay, this has to be refactored. And you go back and you refactor it into something that's a little bit saner. So if you go looking through the code for 522 and you see some slightly rough spots, a lot of those slightly rough spots are actually labeled as to do this is slightly rough. Um, so it's probably a, a, an interesting place to go fishing for small things that you can do that might be very productive. Um, just go looking for to do comments in the code. Yeah, and just uh, and just so that people know, uh, part of part of what we intend to do in time with the with these particular setups is we don't want people to have to to understand or or know these little details in order to get your client or your endpoint running. So one thing that we want to do is to provide clients and uh, libraries and so on as well in the future so that people can get that abstracts uh, most of this away. So that way that you can just focus on your logic and not have to worry about, did you, did you put, put the right parameters in again, MIF working or, or VXLAN or, or so on. Yeah. So, so for us, that that's a, like right now we, we have to, we're running in, into a couple of those little things right now. Uh, and I, and in the future, you you shouldn't have to you shouldn't have to worry with that. Like, you, sh you should have something that you could just plug in and work. So, <laughs> yeah, that, that's the goal. One of the one of the really cool things uh, about five twenty two is we for we spawn four network service clients, and of course, because we're around robbing, you know, two of those, and they're all spawned on the same node. Two of those end up being connected to providers of the network service that are local on the same node, and two end up in, being connected remotely um, to something on a different node. And guess what? They literally don't know the difference. <laughs> cool. <laughs> That's cool. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Right. So before we continue on, are there any questions on uh, PR number 522? No. All right. In that scenario, we will move on to the KubeCon demo project board. Cool. So a lot of the stuff we've actually spoken about already. So we've spoken about uh, creating a VPP agent, uh, VXLAN. Um, let's see, the, uh, I think we spoke about huge pages uh, la quite a yeah, while ago. That's actually quite a while that's ago. Really old. Yeah. yeah. And um. so, in, so for the for the in progress stuff, so the first one is five is uh, five hundred seven. It relates to five twenty two. We already spoke about skydive, uh, dynamically expand NSMDB pool of device IDs. Um, Ed, do you want to talk about that? Uh, so I think actually Andre Platov is working on that. Do we have him on the call? I don't know if we have him on the call. Yeah. So basically, <clears throat> the, the the trick here is. Um, we're using the device plugin API in order to allow us to inject environment variables and mounts into containers. And um, <clears throat> this is sort of a necessary thing. And so right now, the, the component we have, the NSMD uh, P, which is doing that advertisement, um, it is advertising a, you know, sort of a fixed number of device IDs, right? I think it's currently 10. And effectively, we need to make sure that it will scale that pool. So it always has at least 10 in reserve in case you know lots of pods get scheduled all of a sudden. Um, so that as things get allocated, um, it will sort of note that and expand the size of the pool. So if we start with a pool of 10 and we get one of them allocated, then we expand the size of the pool to 11 because that way we've got 10 allocated in the pool uh, and so forth. Um, it's just sort of part of making the whole system more robust. All right, so there's, so there's a few uh, NSM uh, data plane, or sorry, device plugin uh, things that we're listed in as well. 
So I think all of that is still part of the same mm -hmm. uh, of the same talk. And so the last part on here was uh, eliminating race conditions between NSM de de uh, device plugin, the NSM uh, daemon, and the data plane itself. Uh, so has there been, an, do you know of any status changes on that or is that still? There have, been a, there have been a couple of patches that have landed in that area. Um, it, it ends up being, you know, you know I, I think that's probably been fixed. Essentially the problem comes down to the NSMDP should not be advertising NSM resources until the NSMD is up and functional. And the NSMD should not be indicating that it is up and functional until the data plane is up and functional. Um, and you get all kinds of weird behaviors uh, if you get race conditions in that ordering. I, I tend to be of the view that a race condition is simply a failure to enforce a mandatory ordering of events. Um, and so this is just, you know, putting together the order of events for that. Yeah, and um, this is not listed on the board, but we also added in some code for uh, race conditions between the NSMD and the uh, the Kubernetes registry uh, provider as well. So uh, one difference between these components and the registry is that uh, the device plugin and data plane typically connect over a Unix socket and the uh, registry, uh, because we want it to be a little bit more generic so that uh, NSMs that are, that, or rather ENSMs, uh, those are network service managers that are not part of Kubernetes can eventually publish network service endpoints uh, to, to the registry. So we chose to expose that using a, uh, using a TCP IP port. And so, uh, so we've also eliminated a race condition on there where gRPC, uh, when you ask it to connect, uh, will keep on trying to connect. Like it's, it's actually an asynchronous, uh, an, a, an asynchronous connect, and it'll keep trying until until it works, with an exponential back off. And so, uh, so effectively, registry was coming up very fast and uh, triggering the exponential back off, and uh, but still reporting that uh, that the registry was up and running. So that that should be resolved as well. Um, I think that pretty much covers it for the KubeCon board. Uh, do we want to add anything to the to-do the to -do list that we haven't discussed uh, in the meeting already? And we'll add stuff that is previously, we'll, we'll add after the meeting into this board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, there, there are a couple of things for the demo that are still sort of floating around. Um, one of them is we've been talking about for the demo doing something that was basically like Sarah's story, um, where we basically stand up the world's simplest firewall um, and then configure something to act as a VPN gateway. Um, and <clears throat> VPP can be pretty easily configured with some ACLs to do a stateful firewall behavior. Um, and it also supports IPsec. And so what we would, there, there are still some outstanding items there for basically writing some super, super simple network service endpoints for those two operations um, so that we could actually deploy them. And in this case, a network service endpoint is just literally a tiny bit of code that um, configures whatever the additional rules are. Um, and then, um, you know, like ACL rules or sets up your IPsec connection to your IPsec concentrator through the VPN gateway. And then just calls the existing code that we have when a connection comes in to connect the endpoint. You'll connect the incoming connection into the VPP instance. So it shouldn't be super complex. Um, it might be a nice starter project for someone if someone wants to pick up a code editor, but we are sort of facing tight timelines because we're hoping to have some of this, you know, be in a position next week to have the demo more or less um, in decent shape uh, so that we can roll into KubeCon with it. Okay, so, so effectively there's IPsec network service endpoint and a firewall mm -hmm. network service endpoint. And so uh, for, if, for someone who may want to take this on, so would the idea be to take the VPP agent ICMP responder and then modify the configuration to, uh, to add in the firewall and make a connection out to the next, uh, to the next hop? Yeah. I mean, roughly that that's, that's roughly what you're looking at. Um, it's um, you would start with that. Um, you would need to, you know, so you're acting as an NSE, but you also need to act as a network service client and ask for a connection out. This is part of why having the VPP agent network service client example is very helpful, because uh, you would be both a client and a server in that case. 
And then there'd be a little bit of interesting learning because you'd have to learn to program a couple of ACLs with the BPP agent over gRPC. Um, and then there's one other interesting thing that we would have to do, uh, and that is we would probably want to, we've talked about when doing parameters, we've talked about wanting to be able to pass back uh, essentially routes. So you pass back prefixes and, and where they should go. Um, and so you'd want to be able to pass that back to the network service client so that that actually gets configured. So there's a little bit of work around that as well. Is there anyone who would like to take one of these uh, on? Like this is something I think would be relatively low complexity, but uh, would be high impact. So it's, is there anyone who would like to volunteer to take one of these on? Uh, I, okay, is, is my mic on? Okay, so uh, yeah, I think that uh, my um, simple matcher, so simple service selector uh, could be very easy to be done. So after that, I think if there's no one else, I think I can take on the firewall thing. Cool, cool. Okay. So that was it's all to have people working in, in parallel on these things. So, you know, everything is easier when you've got a friend. Yeah. I'm just... <laughs> cool. Yeah. And just, just so you know, uh, if at least from a community perspective. So part of the way that we've operated in the past is that if someone, like if I, if I take on a particular action item or I take a particular action item and someone else gets to it first, then there's no hard feelings or anything. We, you yeah, know, of so course. We, we move forward. So if someone gets to, gets to it first or decides to, to hop onto it, the, the only thing that we, rec rec that we recommend is that if you're working on something that uh, it's publicly on one of these boards that you, put the post on there that you're working on it. So we avoid basically try to deduplicate work. But other than that, like uh, no, no one should feel bad for opting to take something early if no one's gotten up to it yet. Yeah. So. I mean, the other thing I'll, I'll go ahead and do is I'll write up some issues for some of these. Um, I tend to write fairly detailed issues uh, that, that, that people seem to find to be relatively easy to fo follow. Um, <laughs> Too um, easy, I would say, but yeah. <laughs> He just writes all the pseudocode and you just have to translate. He turns, he turns you into a compiler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, there's a shit ton of stuff that is super, super, most of these things are actually super, super easy if you know the right place to look. And, and I, I don't personally, and, you know, I, I don't personally find the frustration of, of not knowing where to look to be productive. So I will often just say, okay, uh, here is the place where you would want to go look and here's the things that I would suggest you think about. And, and that ends up making it fairly easy for most people. Um, that, that said, um, please don't ever read an issue that I write as something you should robotically follow, right? Um, I, I don't need ro people robotically following these things. There are always gonna be things that I don't think of. There are always gonna be better ideas. Um, so I'm trying to help, not to direct. Yeah. Uh, cool, so we don't have that much time. So I'm gonna move forward to uh, to Taylor's uh, C CNCF KubeCon CNF VNF comparison. So is Taylor on the call? I'm here. Apparently uh, it's still a mouthful. How about just CNF comparison? <laughs> your audio is really bad on my end. Like it sounds like a oh, like it robot. Is. Yeah, it's also bad here. It's like a robot in a tunnel. How's this? Better? Way better. Okay, great. I just dropped from the phone call. <clears throat> okay. So we have the CNF that we're um, testing with <clears throat> based on uh, VPP deploying to Kubernetes with uh, the Helm charts. Helm. We had to disable the second uh, set of cores on the second CPU. We're on a dual socket system on packet. The DPDK is having NUMA issues crossing over. It doesn't, we don't have these same problems on Docker because we're able to be very selective on pinning what cores are used. We don't have that type of fine grain control in Kubernetes. After we disabled 
the second CPU socket, then we stopped having the errors. It was actually causing VPP to crash with a DPDK error, memory error. Um, so we have that right now in place until we can figure out anything else on the Kubernetes side. This does allow us to use uh, 28 cores with hyper-threading or 14 cores without hyper-threading on the systems that we're using. And then the in the host side on the worker nodes, we have VPP um, set up as a vSwitch and that's working as well. So all of this is preliminary to the NSM availability for us to plug in, which sounds like it's pretty close as far as some of those needs. Probably won't have them, at least for KubeCon, um, but we'll be looking at how to plug those in um, after. So the next step is setting up the test case that we're going to be using and deploying with Helm for that. This is for the Kubernetes side. On the OpenStack, um, the big side is working with the VPP Neutron plugin. So this is the OpenStack VPP plugin. <clears throat> it's, it was not starting up and showing the devices or anything uh, at last week with the Chef cluster. We had it work in DevStack. We now have it actually showing and talking to the Neutron agent and updating the database in OpenStack. So that looks good. There's some specific setup that we're working through for the test cases on how the bridging and how everything is working with the, the networks between the nodes and working through those issues. And then we should have a good reproducible OpenStack cluster that has VPP as a vSwitch for OpenStack as well. And let's see, that's probably it on that side. We have been working through a multiple um, service um, chains. I'm not going to change any naming right now, but the, the testing that we've been doing is using a snake case topology where it goes in and out of the VPPV switch as well as pipelining, as we're calling it, connecting them directly with the MMIF interfaces. Those are working on CSET. And we've been porting over to um, the all of that code that was functioning on the packet side. And this is in the Docker KVM and then replicating um, what works on Docker KVM into Kubernetes and OpenStack is, is the way that we've been going through that. So those test results are pushed up for all of those services, including running multiple service chains um, on the same node. So that's where we are. Cool. Nice. So is there, um, uh, as always, is there any way that we can help you out or is there uh, anything that we, that we can unblock you, help unblock you on? Well, if people have experience with the OpenStack VPP side, that's an area that that Neutron plugin would definitely be helpful there. And then, and you can reach, ping me on Slack, Cloud Native, or shoot an email either way. And then the other one is um, if you have experience with Kubernetes and the CPU core management side, there's some new stuff that's rolled in like 110 with the policies that you can set, but we need stuff even more fine grain control. So uh, right I, now, I, a lot of that's an area that I've been following. And mm -hmm. um, the, the current state of the art to my understanding in Kubernetes is you can configure a node such that if you request, um, if you request a core, your, if you request some integral number of cores, um, it will give you pinned to those cores. Um, but there is nothing that I'm aware of, even in the pipeline, for allowing you to pick which cores Kubernetes deploys you to. And that, that I, I'm not necessarily the closest guy to that problem, but it is a problem I've been following a lot. 
because I, I realized this kind of stuff was going to be important. Yeah, the the only workaround at this point is probably shutting down cores uh, to ins to hundred percent ensure that you land in a in a certain um, numa zone. But uh, yeah, beyond that, there's there's work that needs to be done in upstream Kubernetes in order to in order to guarantee that entire uh, alignment. Okay. That's where we're going right now. So if, if there's anything that's <clears throat> pre-release or whatever to test, or if there's workarounds in the host um, that we can do that would help them. Um, yeah, anything on that side would be great. Well, right. I'll also ping a, an internal uh, Red Hat team who I think has been looking at some of the stuff and see if they have any, um, if they have anything that they can point me at. So I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, the, the one thing to be careful of is the last time I poked my head into this problem space in the device plugin management working group, um, there were a lot of things being discussed, but nothing had actually reached the status of accepted. So uh, lots of people have lots of hacks, but it's not clear whether any of those hacks are gonna actually make it into the real Kubernetes yet. Yeah, so. and that's my main concern is uh, if you end up depending on something that's not gonna get into Kubernetes, uh, then that, that can be problematic. Yeah, um, cool. So I, I, someone poked me and said that Matra had landed on the call and he had asked if we could talk about the, the time the call occurs. I don't see him on the participants list. Is he in fact on the call? Maybe you don't, but I'm here. That's, the list is very long now. Hello. Okay, cool, cool. Oh, you, you logged in as Fido, not as Matra. Oh, apologies. Uh, yeah, we only, think. we only have, uh, uh, five more minutes. Uh, so let me just toss out a real quick call uh, for help first, and then I'll you have the rest of the time. So uh, anyone who wants to help with documentation or help with the website, uh, any help in that area would be greatly appreciated because it needs to be all up and ready to go for KubeCon. So uh, it's an easy way to join in and help. Uh, and with that, uh, Maciek, you have the, uh, the rest of the time. Well, I don't know what uh, Ed wants me to talk about. Um, I have an issue with the uh, call time. I admit I overlooked the, the consensus <coughs> uh, call or rough consensus call over email. I express my view over email. Um, I don't have anything else uh, to add. The call um, conflicts with FDIO, VP call that is held by weekly, which means that my coverage here will be um, not spotless, but uh, rather spotty. And I wonder if there is any way to avoid the conflict, as um, I believe that there is uh, a huge potential for collaboration between the two projects. So there is a number of people that may want to attend both, like me. And um, there are some folks from FDIO Assisted who would like to do the same. That's all. Cool. So I think this is probably something we need to discuss a little bit more in depth then. So a couple minutes isn't going to, isn't going to be enough. I uh, fully agree. But there's an email thread that I think uh, it's on uh, reawoken. So why don't we do it over email thread? I, I do recall also that, that, uh, that Lucina has a conflict with the CNCF clock meetings that occur monthly. Is it Lucina? About two times a month on Tuesdays. Okay, so basically every other week you, you have a conflict for the talk as well. So yes. not just Matrik who has the conflict. Um, so I think we, we may want to take it to email. I know that we, we have had to move this meeting before and it, it, it's probably better to have this conversation again now because the, the bigger the community grows, the harder it becomes to move meeting times. Um, so we'll, we'll see sort of if there is another time that would work better for the conglomeration of folks. Um, if folks could please speak up about sort of their needs and, and so forth on the um, call. Do, do I, I'm trying to recall, how did we sort this out last time? Um, I, I feel like maybe we did a doodle poll or something. That sounds good, actually. Well, I, 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 I I'm trying to see if anyone remembers what happened there because I, I it seemed to have worked out. 
but I don't remember what the mechanism was. There, there was, uh, I recall, the uh, distant uh, little pull, uh, but I don't recall the consensus over the rule, but maybe I missed the emails. But I think there were multiple pulls in the past. <laughs> well, we had two rounds of this. The first time was when we, were, we decided to stay on Fridays and there were issues with the doodle poll that we ran into. And then the second time, I believe, was just an email thread. And the email thread actually landed us a consensus. OK. So um, I would strongly encourage everybody who attends the meeting to, to please monitor and pipe up on that email thread. Uh, we may very well keep this time, depending on, you know, obviously, finding a time that works worse for more, for more people is not going to be a thing. But maybe we can find a time that works better for everybody. So. Um, the one thing I do want to point out is this time seems to be friendly for the folks in Europe. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, because we do have a bunch of folks in Europe who are turning up now. It's fine for me. Cool. Okay, with that, um, are there any last uh, minute announcements or should we close it up? I had a Posted in here, the CI working group for the CNCF CI working group is at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. If anyone would like to join that's interested in CI topics, uh, you're is, welcome. Here. Is that today? That's today. Cool. It's monthly and it is today. <clears throat> okay, well, in that scenario, uh, Thank you everyone for, for attending and we will see you again uh, next week at the same time. All right, talk to you guys then. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye.